Yes, good morning. Um, this morning I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about putting NX into production. So um, I'm just gonna jump right into it before I give you a description of what the talk is or anything like that. Um, so, oh, that guy might show up every now and again. Ship it. Um, yes, so uh, I'm, I'm here, um, my company is called Amplified. Um, reasons why I'll talk about my company will become a little bit more uh, clear as we go forward, but basically we're, to, I just wanna give you the context that we uh, build a B2B SaaS app. Um, we're an AI-assisted uh, innovation intelligence platform. So uh, a lot of the work that you do in Amplified, it's centered around the idea of a project. Um, and these projects are kind of centered on patent search, um, among other things that you can do. Uh, and it uses an AI-assisted patent search, among other features. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of that uh, to begin with. Now, uh, let's see if I can do this without a, without a, a, a laser pointer. Uh, I'm gonna play a little video. So I'm gonna enter a plain language description of the invention. Uh, then I'm gonna limit the search by a keyword. Uh, this is about cubic, qubits, it's a quantum manufacturing thing. Um, I'm gonna click update results, I'm gonna get some results, uh, it's gonna go run the, result, uh, the search. Then uh, I'm just gonna have a quick little look at them, see what we've got here. You can see that there are some tags, those green and red things. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select all of these results, they're about 200 and some odd, um, and I'm gonna select a classifier that I've already trained I'm gonna go and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, infer and predict uh, the classification for each of those patents. Uh, and that's gonna give me uh, a score uh, and that prediction is going to look either green uh, or red based on whether it's above or below a cutoff, right? So you can kind of see the, we've got these tags on there. Some of them are confirmed, some of them aren't. Um, I can go and I can sort uh, by the, the predicted score um, and see, you've got that 1.0 at the top, that one's not, not confirmed, so I'm gonna confirm it. I can then use that for training data uh, to retrain the, the classifier later. Um, but now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna visualize it. I wanna go and have a look at it. So what you're seeing is uh, we've got some updates as to what's going on, it's doing some work, uh, we're doing a little bit of clustering, we're figuring out what's going on. And you can see these patents now, uh, as each of these dots, um, they've been given a color based on these kind of clusters, and the clusters have been assigned a label. Um, the label kind of tells you what that cluster is about. You can see the things that are close together on the map are basically, uh, are very similar, uh, and things that are further apart are different, right? We can also color by the tag score that we got just a moment ago. So I'll, I'll choose that classifier um, that I had before, and now you can see the things that are more negative are all in one place, and the things that are more positive, the green, um, sorry, the negative is red, the, the green is all in another place. So that might help you guide what you want to do. And you can kind of see the way that the, the clustering and the, the uh, dimensionality reduction plots those things uh, into a space on a two-dimensional map uh, so that the things you know, that, you, that you want to look for are closer together and the things that you don't are a little bit further away. So why did I show you that? It wasn't to advertise my company, although, cool. Um, <laughs> it's because every, basically every part of that workflow that you just saw uses the NX ecosystem. Um, we're, like all the machine learning that's going into this, all the stuff that's, that's driving behind this in our application, it's coming from NX. Um, and they're not just kind of like simple toy machine learning features. They're like, they're good, they're providing a ton of value for our customers. We know that our customers are able to reduce their review time on projects by up to 80% based on sorting them by those classification uh, scores. We know that uh, our customers are able to go and find patents that they never would have found before by looking at them on this map um, and understanding the clusters. They're able to, uh, you know, we've got R&D researchers who are able to have a look at these clusters and understand immediately what the landscape looks like by seeing those labels, right? And this is all happening from NX. So, let's back up a little bit. Hi, I'm Chris. Um, and as I said before, my company Amplified um, is using uh, NX to do all of this stuff. So I've been talking about it for a little while now. Um, as Jim mentioned, uh, in ElixirConf in the US two years ago, I gave a talk called The Future AI Stack, why we're betting on an all Elixir future from ETL to deep learning, right? I've been, I've been kind of singing the praises. I was excited at that point, and I was betting on it, and I wanted to tell everyone why I was excited and why I was betting on it, right? So we made the bet, and last year, 
I came to Berlin and I gave a talk about a year in production with machine learning on the beam. And to be honest, it felt like a victory lap. You know, uh, I, had been, I had been using it for about a year um, and I'm gonna steal a slide from that talk and kind of give you a quick rundown of some of the benefits that we saw over that year, right? So one thing that we did was we eradicated Python completely, which is pretty tough for a company that's using a ton of AI, AI and machine learning. Um, and this was absolutely massive for us as a company, right? So we had already gone from a situation where we were kind of siloed between front end and back end. I was using originally uh, Elixir on the back end using Absinthe and I had a, 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 um, a React front end and we consolidated that by using LiveView. But then I had this situation where a ton of effort was going into Python development to work on our ETL, our machine learning, all of that stuff. Um, and it was kind of splitting the, the team. Uh, we were, you know, we're tiny. We're a very, very small startup and we needed to be able to move fast. And me as a CTO, I'm not just seeing split teams. I've got a split brain, right? I've got to jump back and forth between things. Um, and I'm seeing my, my code being replicated. I'm seeing myself having to replicate permissions, all these different things, right? Um, and so getting rid of Python meant that I could go all in on Elixir all the time. Massive deal. Uh, from, a, from an organizational standpoint as a CTO and as a founder. Um, the next bullet point I think speaks for itself. Um, it, we slashed our monthly AWS spend in half. Um, part of that comes just from some technical debt that existed uh, that we were able to kind of overcome by when we, when we switched. So I don't want to give Elixir 100% of the, the credit for that. Um, but the, the transition allowed us to kind of um, focus on doing things via a happy path that Elixir provided. So when we were using Python, we had to work with these kind of like large uh, ETL pipeline uh, libraries. And we were kind of passing data around. We were doing a bunch of duplication. We were kind of dealing with things in a really difficult way. I, when I gave my talk at, in the US, I kind of said, okay, and then we did this, and then we stored it in S3. And then we did this, and then we stored it in S3. And then we did this, and then we stored it in S3. Just like checkpointing along the way, just doing a ton of work, um, constantly spinning up Spark clusters, because we're working with 150 million patents. It's a ton, right? Um, and what we did is we switched to streaming um, and we used Broadway and using the kind of, uh, as I said, the happy path, what the, the primitives in the language allow for and what some of the, the ecosystem allows for meant that we were able to integrate all of this together uh, and cut our spending. We had faster bulk loading. Um, again, we are constantly developing and, and trying to build new models, um, trying to find better ways of representing patents as dense vectors. So if you've got 150 million of them, you need to, them to be searchable, right? So we were able to, uh, to speed up that process by using, this, by using streaming uh, primitives, and that, and that allowed us to go much, much wider from uh, a horizontal scaling perspective. And we were able to bulk load our models much more quickly, allowed us to iterate. We had better observability. Um, we were much more comfortable using telemetry, right? Using uh, uh, telemetry. Um, the the uh, actually like you know the stuff that's kind of default uh, in the Elixir ecosystem, um, and it was much easier to have everything in one place and to utilize those kinds of that, that kind of uh, comfort that we had because we have you know when you have data engineers they're not always super comfortable with the telemetry side of things they're not always super comfortable with the observability side of things whereas the back end like web app. Uh, engineers are. So we had better observability. And yeah, it just works, right? It's great. So what are we going to talk about today? I've talked, you know, a little bit about, uh, about making a bet, about feeling like we won that bet. But I'm here today because I want to help you do the same. I want to give you a guide uh, to understanding what's going on. Um, and I kind of want to, I, I want to, you know, offer the hand to bring you along, basically. Um, you know, the technology enables me as a founder and a CTO to deliver a world-class product with like a, a smaller team. It's faster. I'm doing it with fewer headaches. Um, and so I, I, again, I just want to share that with everyone else. I want everyone else to be able to join this, uh, join the club. I'm going to come proselytize, right? Like it's very good. I'm up here at the pulpit. Um, it, just to, to say it up front, this isn't a training session. 
Um, everyone has different needs uh, and aspirations when you're building with Elixir and NX. Everybody's, you know, machine learning is as wide of a field uh, in terms of applications as, you know, as nearly as, as engineering generally. Um, but basically, I want to direct this towards people who might have a little bit less machine learning experience, but are coming from an Elixir background, and they want to see kind of how the, the pieces, you know, what the pieces are and how they fit together. Um, and I, I think it'll also be useful for people who are coming from a machine learning background, um, but don't have much of an Elixir background, and they can kind of see what the ecosystem lo looks like in Elixir. Um, yes. So the, the, the kind of overarching thing that we'll, we'll deal with today is that, um, you know, this is... Uh, heuristics, they're ways of thinking. It's a roadmap, right? And that will allow you to be able to follow that roadmap to get to the destination that you want to get to, right? But I'm always gonna be telling it from the perspective of someone who has reached a destination, has his own specialisms, has his own knowledge, so it will definitely be biased in certain perspectives, right? All right, so we're gonna do, we're gonna start with a whistle-stop tour of what this ecosystem looks like. And I'm gonna do it from my perspective, right? I'm gonna provide you with some of the heuristics that I use and the way that I think about it. And I think that that allows me to, to bring the, this into production very easily. So I, I really enjoy working with this stack. I really enjoy working with this ecosystem. Um, and I think that there are certain ways of thinking about it and ways of looking at it that can make it very easy to get from an idea to, uh, to the actual uh, feature, right? Um, so then we're going to say, okay, so how do I ship it? What do I need to think about when I'm shipping it? What's the, what, you know, what are the, the, the bits that I need to actually use? Um, and then we're just going to see it in action. I'm going to show you uh, some of those features at the beginning. I'm going to show you them more in depth, but um, we're going to discuss them from a perspective of how they were implemented using that ecosystem. I'm going to show you how the actual sausage is made, right? So, okay, let's ship it. So let's look at the ecosystem. Okay, we can, uh, we can fit it all on one slide, basically. It's growing, there are other things that aren't mentioned, right? But uh, lots of pretty pictures. Um, and there's actually a real benefit to being able to, move, to fit all of this on one slide, right? There's, you know, there's more out there, it's growing all the time. But if you can get the core in one place in your mind, right? That's a really good thing. And it's a natural product of a smaller community. Um, you know, we are a small but really excellent community. Um, smaller than Python, I guess. Um, it means there's uh, less decision fatigue um, and you can kind of rally around this core stack. Um, you know, it helps that the creator of the language was involved uh, and created this, you know, was one of the, the co-creators of NX, which is the core of, of all of this, and has been so, so deeply involved in uh, the development of this ecosystem. Uh, I think that that makes a huge difference in terms of the way that it integrates with the language and the way that it makes things Elixir-ish. So, you know, Python, when you're working in Python, let's say, you know, you're working with TensorFlow, one of the biggest complaints that you had uh, it's a little bit less now, but is that you, you, were, you felt like you were working with these computation graphs, you call them, through a keyhole. But there were, you know, there are APIs on, tops of, uh, on top of APIs, DSLs on top of DSLs, and every time you wanted to do something different, you were reaching for a different tool that may have had a different perspective on how you should use Python at all, let alone, you know, how it should align with all of the other tools that you have. These tools are really integrated, and that's a massive benefit. Okay, that's, uh, you know, we're able to punch above our weight. So let's have a look at what I would say is like the, the NX stack, right? Um, so I've removed a couple of the other things because they are kind of peripheral. We'll talk about them in a bit, but these are the things that, that really build on NX, okay? Um, they all utilize NX and they're all enabled by kind of some of the creative and unusual decisions that were made going into making uh, NX. And getting an understanding of how that all works together is, I think, key to actually going off and shipping it and, and, keep it, you know, and, and being a responsible user of these things, right? So let's have a look at NX to begin with then. So I'm gonna take the first sentence from the, uh, from the readme and we're gonna unpack it. And we're gonna do that for each of these libraries. We're gonna look at the first sentence of the readme and. I'm gonna read it, not you, I'm gonna read it, right? <laughs> and the reason why I'm gonna read it is because I'm using it in production right now and I can tell you what I see when I read these things, okay? Uh, and hopefully that's interesting to you. 
So there's a single, you know, a single sentence right at the top. It has two parts. The first part is NX is a multi-dimensional tensor library for Elixir. Second part, with multi-stage compilation to the CPU or GPU. Who here in this room understands what the first part means? <laughs> the camera will not capture that it is a very small number. <laughs> Who here in this room knows what the second part means? Hey, more people. I, I don't know how that's possible. But <laughs> all right, but the sentence, it, it carries a lot of meaning. So let's, let's just get right into it, okay? So what is a tensor? I assume that that's the kind of knowledge that you need for that first part to make sense. Let's raise our hands again. Who knows what a tensor is? Who knows what a tensor is from a math perspective? From a computing perspective? The difference between the two. <laughs> I've got one. <laughs> okay. So a tensor is not a tensor. I, I almost put up the ceci n'est pas un, un pip picture, but I thought it would be too, too trite. But I mention it anyway, so who cares? Um, so it's, it, it's not, right? So in mathematics, a tensor is a geometric object that describes a linear relationship between scalars, vectors, and other tensors. More formally, a tensor is an element of a tensor, sorry, a tensor is an element of a tensor product of vector spaces. Honestly, I, I'm not gonna explain what that means. Uh, if you don't know, it, it will not be helpful to you if I do. What will be helpful for you is to understand that when we're talking about it from this perspective, we're talking about a data structure, which if you squint at it just right, it kind of looks like that mathematical thing, which is why it's, it's used, but it's not. It's not exactly the same. When we're talking about tensors as a data structure, what we're really talking about are multidimensional arrays, okay? So you can see that on the left, we've got a two-dimensional array. On the right, we've got a three-dimensional array. These arrays can keep going up in dimensions, but you know, it's, it's one of those things. I, I think it was, uh, was it Gilbert Strang who said, uh, you know, how do you see four dimensions? You just look at a three-dimensional object and say 4D, 4D, 4D. <laughs> it works. Um, so you, you've got this, this data structure um, and what it's representing are, you know, uh, are columns and rows, and then multiple dimensions on top of that. So you might have stacks of those. So I'm gonna steal a little bit from the, the NX intro live book. Uh, I've taken some screenshots here. Go, go use it, it's really, really good. Um, it's, it, it's really well written. Um, so you know, systems of equations are a central theme in numerical computing, right? They're often expressed and solved with multi-dimensional arrays, the tensors that we were talking about before. Um, and this is what a two-dimensional array might look like, and this is how you might represent it in Elixir. So you might have a list of lists, right? Who here is comfortable with a list of lists? Yeah, we're all comfortable with a list of lists. Yeah, great, okay, good. Most people. I, I'm sorry for the people who didn't raise their hands. Um, <laughs> so, uh, this, is, this is fine for many of your kind of like typical functional programming applications, uh, but it breaks down when you get into deep nesting and when you get into random access of those elements. So let's say I want to just grab the four. Well, in, in, you know, with enum, I have to map over everything else. I have to get through everything else to get to that four, right? And that's costly. So what a tensor provides for us is a multidimensional array with a predetermined shape and type that allows us that random access and allows us speed. We'll get into the speed in a little bit. Um, so the Elixir numeric types, they, they, they lack uh, you know, optimization for the numerical applications. Um, and so this stuff, you know, as I said, we'll get into this in a bit, but this stuff works fine uh, when you've got hundreds or thousands of calculations, but it starts to break down when you want to start doing things with millions of, uh, of calculations, right? Okay, so let's look at what we have instead of that list of lists. We kind of have a list of lists. It looks like a list of lists, but it's different. You can see there's a little bit at the top. I, do I have laser? I have laser. There's a bit at the top. Uh, that it says NX tensor, it tells you what kind of struct this is, right? Um, and the data is presented, it's presented as a list of lists. That's how we do the, the inspect. Um, the, the type of the tensor is over here. Let's have a look here, there, S64. I have shaky hands, so this is like at this angle, it's real bad. Um, so it's an S64, which is a, a signed integer 
uh, with a, a bit width of 64 bits, okay? We're all pretty comfortable with things like bit widths, right? We're all comfortable with like, you know, 32-bit floats, 64-bit floats, that kind of stuff. Um, and all these different types are available for tensors. Uh, and tensors have to be a single type, right? Uh, and you can kind of then see the, the dimensions here, right? So you can see the size of, and the name of the dimensions, okay? So that gives you an understanding of the shape of that multidimensional array, uh, what type of data is held in it, and if you have any names for, for those elements, all right? So we're all kind of comfortable with, there's this thing called a tensor. You don't have to necessarily understand how it works yet, but we've got that. So now the second part, what are we talking about when we say multi-stage compilation? Uh, who is familiar with multi-stage compilation from something like uh, LLVM? Okay, cool, yeah. Um, basically, you know, a multi-stage compilation allows you to, to compile down to an intermediate representation that then allows you to do uh, to compile to some other representation in machine code, right? So probably when you're looking at that tensor that I showed you a minute ago, you're sitting there going, wait a second, I heard the beam was not very good at number crunching. I heard the beam was not very you know, fast for mathematics. How, how are we able to handle these tensors efficiently? How are we able to do that random access? You, know, you showed me that you've got this struct, but how do I actually go and do it without getting bogged down by like, uh, you know, our, our enum API and stuff like that? This all isn't the beam strong points. So that's where NX, I think, gets interesting. So NX can do a ton, but I often just think of NX as an API. So it's, it's doing a ton more, right? But I think about it as just the API. Now, what am I talking about when I say that? You know, nobody made the beam faster here. Nobody gave it magical powers. Um, if you go and look at the code for the top level NX module, you're gonna find that it looks like this, where you're not actually seeing the, the, the logic of the operations at all, right? You're not seeing, you know, this is, this is from binary. You're not seeing the logic of taking, you know, some binary and turning it into a tensor here. What you're seeing is the logic of, you know, handling the arguments and then passing it to uh, a backend, okay? So that's idea one here, uh, is the notion of a backend. So uh, NX uses a behavior. Uh, who here is familiar with a behavior in Elixir? Cool, good, I, I didn't want to have to explain it. Um, <laughs> so NX, NX backends are implemented as a behavior, and there is a pure Elixir implementation, uh, but the magic happens because there are implementations that come from, uh, that come from outside of the beam, right? So uh, the, there are some, some uh, different ones that are available. There's also CandleX, but it's a little bit less, uh, less mature. So the kind of main one will be EXLA. TorchX is also available. Um, you know, backends are one of the, the main parts of the magic here. Another part's compilers. We're going to get to those in a second. So uh, the kind of way to think about this, backends and compilers, is uh, from Sean Moriarty. Um, he said the relationship between backends and compilers is kind of like the relationship between interpreted programming languages and compiled programming languages, which I think makes sense. Um, and I'll expand on that as we go. So the default NX backend is the NX binary backend. So it uses Elixir to manipulate tensors, right? So EXLA and TorchX are implemented with NIFs, who here is familiar with native implemented functions. NIFs, cool, yes. Um, so effectively, those backends are going to evaluate the NX functions um, and yield the results every time. That's kind of the, the limitation of a backend is that they are, they're eager, right? Um, but they allow you to rapidly prototype off of the beam, right? They allow you to rapidly prototype utilizing, um, you can start to use things like GPUs. You can use optimized uh, access to CPUs. Um, you, can, you can use TPUs. You know, these, these uh, allow you to um, move that data into a place where you can do that random access. You can do the computation much, much faster and where you can move the memory around to other devices. And that's where the kind of multi-staged aspect of this comes from, right? So um, 
what, what is happening is that you end up with uh, the compilation to the machine code that can run on the GPU or the TPU or what have you, okay? So, um, let's, uh, let's move on to here. So, yes, so compilers are the next part. They're the, they're the next kind of major magic that goes with this. So the limitation of backends is that they're kind of like interpreters, right? In that, uh, you don't get to do things like, you can't do fusion, you can't like uh, optimize them and they're eager, so when you are doing a whole bunch of, of, um, of operations, those operations happen you know, in order and we're using immutable data structures. So this is one of the kind of beauties of NX is that it feels like it's immutable from the perspective of the user. Um, and immutability is always a challenge when you're dealing with trying to optimize and get the most out of what you're, what you're doing, right? So um, we have a separate thing called DefN. So who here is familiar with the Def macro? Put an N on it and, <laughs> and then what you can do is uh, use a subset of Elixir um, and uh, those, those functions then become tensor aware. Right? So NX will replace the operators, like your kernel operators and things like that, with DefN counterparts, which then use NX functions that are optimized for tensors. So the defin de uh, definitions then allow you to build computation graphs of the individual operations, and the, there's a just-in-time compiler that emits native code for the desired computation unit, whether that's a GPU, TPU, CPU, whatever. Okay, so what does that look like? It looks like this, this is a computation graph. Um, this is taken from the announcement, uh, the announcement blog post, so uh, it's possible that this looks a little bit different now, but uh, I just went and stole it. Um, <laughs> there's more to it uh, than, you know, there's more to NX than this, and we're going to get into a little bit more of it later. Um, but this, I think this understanding of the, the functionality that's going on, that there is, uh, that there are, you know, backends, compilers that we're reaching out outside of the beam and producing these optimized bits of machine code that can then be placed on any piece of hardware that you want is core for understanding everything else that you'll do. Um, and it's core for, for being a responsible user of it when you go to actually put this into production. And it's core for understanding the value that, that the other libraries that build on it can offer you and why they're different from other, other, uh, other ecosystems. Okay, so what are you gonna use it for? It's the foundation of other libraries that we'll discuss. I think depending on what you're doing, you often won't write a lot of NX directly unless you are doing uh, you know, a bit of data manipulation here, here and there. If you're getting into you know, cutting edge science, which you, you can, or if you want to build your own algorithms, which you can, you're going to write NX directly. But I think a lot of, the, a lot of what the typical application is going, to, is going to be is building with the libraries that we're going to see in a moment. Uh, and those use NX, but they won't require you necessarily to write NX directly. Um, but as I said, you know, sometimes you need to use it. Familiarity with how it works and tensor operations will allow you to like massage your data and do some simple calculations when you need to. Um, and you can write your own death in for those situations. So if you've got something that you've written, you can, you can write death in and it will be accelerated and it will fit in with everything else. Okay. As we go through this, I'm gonna make some comparisons to other libraries uh, here and there. So NX doesn't map like one-to-one -to, -one to other libraries. I think it's something that's relatively unique. It's, part of, it's partly enabled because of the metaprogramming facilities that we have in Elixir. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a creative architecture. Um, it definitely takes JAX uh, from Python as inspiration. JAX can be used to accelerate, um, to basically use XLA in, this, in a similar way to uh, EXLA and NX to accelerate NumPy. I see the comparison to NumPy quite frequently for NX, but I don't think it's very accurate. I think it's much closer to JAX. Uh, it's accurate insofar as you're working with multidimensional arrays and you have multidimensional array operations. Um, but the library, I think, comes much closer to JAX. Um, it's also similar to like PyTorch tensor, which are the operations that you can do on a tensor object in Pyth PyTorch, some of the lower level operations that you do. Uh, similar to some of the TensorFlow lower level operations. Theno, if anybody still remembers that Theno exists. Um, but 
yeah, it's one of the, the biggest powers here. Because it's you know, just an API with a ton of stuff going on behind it, the, with pluggable backends and compilers, you have a single library, um, and you don't have to, to choose from all of these things. You can write really clear, crisp uh, um, tensor operations and go ship them anywhere you want. Now, that provides us with a, a really solid foundation from which we can build. And so we'll move on to the next bit. So Axon builds on this. Axon's been around since basically day one as well, the NX project. And what Axon allows you to do is build NX-powered neural networks for Elixir. Now, I've been harping on the NX-powered part there. Like, that's super important. Because what it means is that everything in Axon is defined with def n, which means that it all compiles, it all gets all those benefits that we've seen from NX. And this is just worth keeping in, in consideration as you go through. So, um, you know, one thing you can do with tensor operations, one thing lots of, lots of people do with tensor operations is build neural networks. Um, and the reason why you have a library like Axon for this is because you don't want to be recreating your common neural network components every time you need a model, right? Um, and you want, to be, you want to all the utilities for like training, inference, stuff like that, right? So um, we can have a look at like some of the, the low level modules that we have here. So Acton ha Axon has Axon activations, which kind of fill in those gaps that we're talking about. So these give you element-wise activation functions. I'm not gonna get too much into, into this because I'm not gonna teach you how machine learning works or how deep learning works or neural networks work as we go. If you know what that is, then cool. Um, the initializers, the parameter initialization functions, it gives you layers, which are the kind of like layer implementations, uh, it gives you common loss functions, and gives you metrics. Now, all of those come together as a low-level API to give you a high-level API, which is really, really nice in Elixir-ish. So what, we're what you can see here is uh, building a model, and uh, you're building it up. You're able to, to you know, chain, the, you know, pipe these functions together and build up um, the representation of a model. And you can see that it, it gives you an axon struct. Um, and you end up with a model that looks kind of like this. This is what your data is, is passing through on every forward pass, right? So you can see that you've got a, a name for them. You can see the shape of them. Um, and we know the type up there in the template. We see that it's an F32. We're using the same data types, right? Because it's all NX under the hood. Um, and you can see that you've built this, this neural network. And you did it with what? Seven, seven lines of code, right? You did it with seven lines of code. You've got a neural network. Um, Lovely, we can use Mermaid to have a look at that. So you can then take that model and you can train it, right? So you can define a loop. Um, and I just can't express, as someone coming from kind of the, the ecosystem of Python, just how exciting this is, having a very, very simple way to create this like functional training loop with minimal code and with minimal decision fatigue. Because when you're in Python, you're choosing between like, you've got like PyTorch Ignite, PyTorch Lightning, you've got Keras, you've got all these different, just all these different libraries, right? Like that are gonna help you train your model. This gives you one place, one stop, right? And so you set the loss, you set the optimizer, you pass in the model, and you are off to the races, right? Boom. Tells you the epoch, tells you the, the, batch, uh, the, the, the batch that you're on, tells you the loss, and there you go. You've got your, your updated uh, weights and biases. Cool. So what do you use it for? You want to use it to write your own neural networks? Train those neural networks. Pretty simple, yeah? Comparisons el elsewhere. Um, this, this is where the kind of splitting up feels a little bit different, right? So NX provides some of the core that's in PyTorch. It's PyTorch Ignite, PyTorch Lightning, TensorFlow, Keras. So uh, Axon sits at a, in a very particular place, kind of in between the, some of those high-level libraries in Python uh, and some of the lower-level libraries. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a really handy place to, to exist. All right, move on from there. So who here knows what that picture is for? Yeah, Bumblebee. I, I love this picture. I think it's, it's super sweet. A um, little numbat. Um, and Bumblebee. We're just, we're just going up the, the hierarchy here, or down the, I don't know which way, which way are we going. Uh, we're going up the hierarchy here. So Bumblebee provides pre-trained neural network models on top of Axon, right? And it integrates with hugging face models. So I just explained what Axon was, and I think it makes sense that you guys kind of understand 
it's built on top of Axon, all right, cool. Why do you need another library on top of that? Well, pre-training and existing models is really important in the machine learning ecosystem these days. So, you know, gone are the days when you are going to go and try to solve a problem by building your own little multi-layer perceptron and training it and going and applying that to whatever you're doing. Models are much bigger now. You want to, you don't want to be using, you know, uh, you don't want to be having to train your own model from scratch. You've got big companies that will do that for you and open source it and provide the weights, right? And you can go and use those and fine tune. Um, so let's have a look at uh, Hugging Face. Who here is familiar with Hugging Face? Fantastic, okay, that makes my life much easier. Great, yes, so Hugging Face, uh, I guess they're a behemoth now, right? Like, and so being able to integrate with them is a massive coup for any ecosystem. And what Bumblebee provides for you is basically that kind of off-the-shelf experience that you get in Hugging Face Transformers, but for Elixir, okay? So this is, uh, you know, I'm showing you here what the, what the kind of model zoo looks like at Hugging Face, and uh, this is what a model card might look like. And you can go there and you can, you can grab one of these pre-trained models and then you can go and pop it into Bumblebee. And it's super, super simple. This actually has more code than you need. I've just stolen it from the docs. Um, but you, know, you, you can go as simple as two lines of code and you've, you know, you, you've basically, or three lines of code and you've got the ability to infer using a massive model. It will go and fetch it from, from uh, Hugging Face and bring it back in. All you have to know is where in Hugging Face it is, right? Now, you know, it's not all wine and roses. That's the right term, right? Um, you know, it, there's, there's not full coverage of every single model that's in, that's in Hugging Face, right? It's, it requires being built. It requires uh, building the Axon implementation. Um, but there's a, a pretty good level of coverage and a lot of the most important models you can, you can absolutely bring in. And, and it, as this, this library has been developing and building over time, it's, uh, it's creating like pluggable portions, right? So certain, uh, certain um, like attention mechanisms can be reused across different models. So it's kind of a, a, a snowball effect that's been happening. But basically, this is what you're gonna want to use to, to just do deep learning. If you don't care about doing research, doing all that stuff, and you just wanna get into it, this is what you wanna use. You wanna use, uh, you wanna use uh, Bumblebee. And out of the box, you're getting things like, you can use LLMs. Think about Llama or Mistral. You can load those in Bumblebee. You can use stable diffusion and generate pictures, all right? You can do speech to text with Whisper. You can do image classification, you can do text classification, you can do question answering, you can do text generation, you can do embeddings, you can do fine tuning of all of these things, right? And it's all readily available in Bumblebee. So we've built from NX down at the bottom, and we understand how it all works with def end and back ends and compilers. Then we go up to Axon, which is a little bit lower level than, than Bumblebee, and then up to Bumblebee where you can just basically have the rubber hit the road. And unless you need to actually do, you know, build your own models or you need to make an implementation in Bumblebee, which I encourage you to do, this is the place, this is the entry point, this is how you can jump off and immediately get value. Okay, comparisons elsewhere, I don't, I don't think there's anything else other than Hugging Face Transformers. It's pretty, pretty straightforward uh, in terms of the comparison to that model. All right, so one last uh, kind of the, the ignored little, you know, little brother or whatever of these, of these libraries, the one that doesn't get as much of the credit is Scholar. And uh, Scholar's really, really wonderful. It's traditional machine learning tools that are built on top of NX. Now, why is that, why is that cool? So 90% of the time, you don't actually need machine learning, or, or sorry, you don't actually need deep learning. Uh, or when you do actually use those big, those big models, you wanna do stuff with it afterwards, right? So, you know, you wanna be able to do things like plot a map on the, on the board, you wanna be able, or on the, on the screen, you wanna be able to, to do stuff like uh, classify your patents, which I showed you before. And in order to do that, you need the kind of nuts and bolts, right? And it's, it's, uh, this, this gives you those nuts and bolts. Um, Scholar can be used for regression, clustering, classification, dimensionality reduction, nearest neighbors, and metrics. It's, it's kind of your toolbox that you wanna to go to. Now what's cool about it, 
I'm going to compare it and I'm going to say it's, it's really similar to scikit-learn. That's, that's the inspiration, right? Python inspiration. But what's really cool about it is that unlike scikit-learn, you get all that acceleration that we were talking about, the, the ability to go and run these things on GPUs and TPUs and all of that, just right out of the box because Scholar is all built on DefN. Okay, so every algorithm that's implemented in Scholar is using DefN, so it's all, you can, you can go and throw it onto your TPU or your GPU and, and do whatever expensive calculation that you need to do. That's not true in other ecosystems, and this is pretty cool. Okay, so now we're gonna move outside of the NX stack or what I'm calling the NX stack. This is all, this is stuff that's uh, a little bit more peripheral, but it's also kind of necessary for this machine learning ecosystem. So we'll start with, uh, with, with kind of my baby, which is Explorer. Um, and Explorer is uh, a place to do series, which are one dimensional, and data frames, which are two dimensional. Uh, you know, it's a way, to, a way to do data analysis with those things for fast and elegant data exploration in, Explorer, uh, in Elixir, right? So who here knows what I'm talking about when I say a data frame? Cool, some. Who here thinks it's like that kind of like weird thing that your data scientist friend uses and gets really excited about and you're like, why are you so excited about that? It's like just a database, man. What are you doing? Nobody? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yes. A data frame looks like this. I'm going to explain why they're a little bit more exciting in a second. Um, but this is, you know, we talked about multidimensional arrays before. One of the things about multidimensional arrays is that they all have to be the same type, right? So data frames are kind of like multidimensional arrays, except they're two-dimensional or one-dimensional if you have a series, but a data frame is two-dimensional and allows you to mix types. So each of those columns is what we call a series, it's one dimensional, and they can all be of different types. Now what's cool is because it's in a two dimensional array, they're all aligned. So all the tabular stuff that you might do with, you know, with uh, SQL, you can do in memory and you can do really, really fast. And that's very, very useful because, this is oft quoted, I refuse to put a source here, um, and it's mostly true. Uh, you know, I did this for a little while, um, and I would say that it may actually be higher than 80%, but this is the, the oft-quoted number of the amount of time that data practitioners spend finding, cleaning, organizing data, right? You want to go and you want to use Bumblebee, which you should go do, you need to be able to, to feed it data, and that data needs to be clean and it needs to be the, the, the right thing, right? When you, whether you're doing training or you're doing inference, you need to know what you're giving it. Uh, and maybe you want to do it like chunk by chunk. Maybe you want to do it based on, maybe you just want to infer based on, you know, one category of something. So we can go back and look at here. What you could do is grab like just the ones for Afghanistan, right? Or just the, just the rows for uh, Anguilla or what have you, right? And you can do all sorts of cool stuff. You can chop and change it and, uh, and end up with data that will allow you to, uh, to use your machine learning uh, more effectively, okay? or visualization, which we'll get into in a bit. Um, just the thing to think about with Explorer is that it, it runs, by a, runs with a philosophy that's very similar to dplyr. Is anybody here familiar with R or dplyr? Yeah, yeah, R is a weird language. <laughs> it's, it's uh, yeah, dplyr is, is uh, kind of a, uh, you know, it's beloved by a lot of data scientists because it provides a functional implementation or a functional uh, approach to data, data frame manipulation. Um, so, but one of the, the philosophies that it takes is that it, it's meant to constrain your options by using these simple verbs, um, verbs like join, select, filter, kind of your SQL verbs, right? Um, and apply those to data frames. You can translate your thoughts into code. Then the last point on here is that it uses efficient backends, so you spend less time waiting for the compiler. Wait, what are we talking about? Backends? We said that before with NX. What are backends now? Um, when, when I made uh, Explorer originally, I just stole the idea from NX, the idea of pluggable backends. And uh, you know, it, we use Polars, which is a really, really fast Rust-based data frame library as the main backend. 
Um, but the, it's all built based on a behavior of, of uh, Explorer backend so that you can actually go and plug in other backends if you wanted to. So there are plans to be able to allow you to use the same code that you write locally to manipulate SQL actually on the server, for example, or to, to deal with something like, um, you know, Ballista, which is kind of like the, the Rust version of Spark and allow you to do distributed computing just using the same API and the same, the same interaction that you use. So what does it look like? Um, looks like a little bit like this. This, is, this example allows you to kind of see how it integrates with the existing ecosystem, right? So one of the really, really cool things about uh, NX, or sorry, one of the cool things about, yeah, one of the cool things about NX is that it provides um, a protocol for, uh, for um, working on tensors and what we've got here is, is uh, we're creating a def n function and then actually uh, applying it to the data frame using NX, the, the NX container. Um, so we're taking a data frame and we're applying the def n function and we're getting back a tensor. And now what's extra cool about that is that it's done with zero copy, right? So it's utilizing um, the, like the arrow implementation that, Pi, that, uh, that uh, Polars uses uh, in order to basically to decode it directly into a tensor representation, all happening like with the NIFs behind the scenes. Um, so we're not having to uh, serialize and deserialize the data into Elixir and then back out, right? We can actually just go and do that all in Rust and C and all that good stuff, C++ rather. So what do you want to use it for? Data manipulation, think your database operations in memory, data IO, uh, insights like business, in, uh, business intelligence and uh, online analytical processing. One of the cool things about Polars is that it's got really great support for lazy operations. So when you are working with machine learning and you are working, you're trying to train machine learning models, one of the biggest bottlenecks is often data loading, okay? And so with something like this, what you can do is you can use a huge amount of data that might not fit into memory, and you can stream it in, run it through this processing pipeline, and get it immediately into Bumblebee or, or what have you. Um, so that kind of like online approach is, is really, really helpful. Uh, comparisons elsewhere might be pandas, polars, R data frames, dplyr, tidyr. Um, you guys all thought R was weird, so I'm not going to harp on this too much. Uh, and the last one, I think the, like, the kind of like secret weapon uh, that goes, you know, that, uh, that brings this all together is Livebook. Who here is using Livebook? Please, everyone, raise your hand. If you're not using Livebook, just, just go and do it now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Don't, don't actually leave, please. Um, so, again, from the, from the description, I'm, I'm not going to harp too much on Livebook um, just because it's huge. And there's so much going on with it. There are tons of, of available uh, resources online, but I want to just highlight a couple of things and highlight the way that it helps this ecosystem. Um, Provides code notebooks. Now, code notebooks are something that you, if you've worked in Python or in R, none, none of you have worked in R, so if, if some of you have worked in Python um, and you've used Jupyter notebooks, um, that's really the main popularizer. Uh, it's kind of uh, this, this grows out of this idea, Donald Knuth, literate programming, um, the idea of being able to like describe your program along with the actual code and then execute that code. Um, and Livebook looks like this. Uh, it, it's really, really valuable for machine learning um, in a few ways. One is that when you're doing machine learning, if you are just writing code, even if it's well commented, and that's your whole end product, you've probably messed something up somewhere. <laughs> and it's not gonna be usable by anybody else. What am I talking about? So machine learning is really, really complex. Um, and if you're, if you're getting into it and you're trying to do data analysis, you need to be able to kind of communicate your results in a way that goes beyond just the code or beyond just the end product of the code, right? Beyond just the inference. So Livebook gives you the ability to do that. It gives you the, the ability to actually go and visualize the stuff that you're working on, right? And it does that with a thing called Kinos. Again, I'm not gonna explain Kinos too much, but basically they provide this, these interactive widgets uh, that you get in your Livebook. And you can actually kind of see if I execute this here, um, because it's utilizing a process and it's able to send messages to that process and you're able to actually kind of update it in real time in your, in your live book, which I think is awesome. Um, and you also have this other thing called smart cells, which uh, smart cells 
basically provide you with a, a GUI, a, 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 a user interface for generating code. Um, and you can actually switch back and forth between the smart cell, which allows you to, to kind of do things from a UI perspective and see the code that it generates. It's just amazing for learning the libraries and, and getting things done. There's a smart cell for Bumblebee, for example, which will allow you to just go and just get off the, off the ground immediately. So what do you want to use it for? Literally everything. <laughs> you should use Livebook for everything. It's changing kind of the way that, uh, that we do things in Elixir. So you use it for prototyping, reproducible reports, use it for internal tools, use it for documentation, use it for collaboration, use it for interactive testing, use it for your runbooks, use it for everything, okay? Comparisons elsewhere, Jupyter Notebooks, as I said, R Markdown, uh, org mode. All right, whistle stop store, not so much a whistle stop. Let's get to the, the good part. Let's ship it. Hello. Okay, so NX has our back for shipping it. I think this is you know, one of the, the coolest things about this whole ecosystem. It's not just NX, it's NX serving. I love those little magical transitions, they're kind of fun. Um, so NX serving, it encapsulates client and server work to perform batch requests. Again, this is from the readme. Um, let's talk about it, okay? What do we mean by client and server work? We're talking about processes, right? They can be executed on the fly, but what we're talking about is we're talking about a client and a server process. Um, when you're running machine learning work, the model is often massive, right? Like, they can be gigs in size, but they, they, and you need to get them into memory, and they need to sit there in memory while something else goes and asks for it, right? And this is where Elixir really, really shines. I mean, you've got this actor-based concurrency model, and you've got, um, you, what you can do is you can throw your model into a process, and that process will sit there, and it will wait and for other processes to ask for inference, right? This is really, really cool. Um, so let's, let's just have a look and see what it looks like, right? So you have serving, which holds your model, holds it in memory, doesn't, you don't have to like replicate it, you don't have to load it in and out of memory, it's just sitting there, and it's listening, to, uh, it's listening for requests. Um, those requests come in, and uh, what serving will do is it will automatically batch them for you. Who here knows about the importance of batching in machine learning? Okay, cool. So batching is really important in machine learning because GPUs work really well on parallel operations, right? So you've got thousands of tensor cores and they're going and doing things all in parallel, right? And so what you wanna do is you wanna stack as much information into each run that you can so that you can use those cores efficiently, right? And so what serving does is it takes the request from the different clients, it batches them up given a size that you might set or a timeout that you might set. So what, I, what that means is once I have 10, then I'll go and process it. Or once I get to a timeout of, let's say, 100 milliseconds, I haven't received 10, I've actually got four, I'll go and process it. And then what it does is it unbatches them and sends them back to the requester, and the requester has no idea that it was ever batched in the first place. This is really, really cool. You think about the, the notion that like uh, a live view is a process, right? And so let's say you have a ton of different uh, clients that are live view processes. All of your different, uh, your, your web users, your, your application users can all run inference at once and there's no like, there's no waiting in line. They're not going in, you're not going and running and hitting an external API. You're not doing anything like that. What you're doing is just going and asking this server and the server is going to do, handle all the batching logic and all of that cool stuff to use your, your, um, your hardware as efficiently as possible. So the client doesn't have to know about the other ones, right? And it's just a process, right? Like you just throw it into your supervision tree. You put some, some configuration in there, and you start the, 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 you know, you start your supervisor and you're, you're good to go. Um, and what does it look like? So, you know, you have to, you create your batch, you send it off and ask for a batch run, um, and you end up getting back your result, right? So, what's a batch, right? We talked about batching a second ago. So it is a lazily traversed, concatenated, and padded upon defin invocation. <laughs> That, that one's tough for me to understand. The, most of the documentation is really, really clear, I think. That one's like, it's, there's a lot of information, a lot of work being done in one sentence there, right? So, you know, as we said, you're, um, you're loading all of this stuff into memory. As we mentioned, we wanna be able to utilize the GPU cores concurrently. So what we end up with is we go back to that multidimensional array. What's a batch? Typically what, you, what it is, is you add another dimension, right? And then you are able to split based on that dimension. Pretty simple, okay? 
So let's go back to this example that I gave you with Bumblebee before, and I'm gonna point out the thing that I didn't talk about. So at the top, I talked about, okay, we've got the model, Bert, and we've got the, the tokenizer there, which we'll probably don't have time to discuss tokenizers, but what you end up with is the serving. Now what's really cool about Bumblebee is one of the core features of Bumblebee is that you're, you're creating servings with a single line. So you don't have to go and define it for yourself. You don't have to go and do that, like uh, you know, build the, the, uh, the just-in-time uh, compiled model and set the preprocessor pre and the postprocessor and all that stuff. You just get it for free. Okay, what, 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 and the way that you think about those servings is a pipeline. It's a pipeline that sits in a process, right? That's the way that you should be thinking about it. Okay, so super cool. Now let's think about what we need to deploy this stuff. Let's, let's do a little deployment checklist. What do you need to be thinking about when you're gonna go and put this into production? So let's say you've taken, you know, you, you've just, you've, you've gone and you've done this, right? Like you've, you've built Bumble, the, you, you've gone and uh, grabbed a, a BERT model and you, you have set up your, your serving. What do you need to think about when you wanna go and put that into your Phoenix application or your, you know, your, your stream processor or whatever it is that you wanna build? So you need to use uh, a compiler. I, I, I really strongly suggest using a compiler. It's, uh, it's going to be much faster than just using backends. You wanna set a corresponding backend though. You wanna use both of them, right? So you config, in this, this case I'm showing what you can do if you're using config. You know, we all know how to use keyword lists and configure the, our applications, but what we're saying is we're gonna use a default backend of EXLA, and default death end options where we're saying, hey, I want you to use EXLA and I want you to do it with CUDA. CUDA is uh, for GPUs, for, uh, for NVIDIA GPUs, okay? Next, you wanna ensure that you're setting the right XLA target. I've been bitten by this uh, <laughs> in that I set the, uh, I set the, env the environmental variable correct in staging and everything looked good and then I didn't set it in production and I got bitten by really slow, slow stuff because everything was running on the CPU instead of on the GPU. It defaults to the CPU, okay? It's really awesome. Like this is this is like not just a gotcha. It's also just really amazing that what you can do is use the exact same code and change nothing except for an environment variable based on where you're deploying, and you can target these different architectures. I think that's amazing. So just make sure that you're setting your XLA target to the architecture that you want, unless you're on a CPU, in which case you don't have to set it. Um, you want to hand, ensure that you're handling dirty I/O threads for GPUs if you're using GPUs. So this is kind of like, it's in the EXLA like, uh, guides and the documentation, but I sometimes forget about it. Um, because this is using a NIF, um, GPU executions run in dirty IO threads, um, and this can have some problems with certain versions of CUDA or CUDA NN. So just keep an eye on it, okay? Uh, use telemetry. So, you know, I said before that telemetry gives us all this stuff, like uh, Bumblebee, uh, NX serving, they all emit telemetry events and you should use it. So like this is from one of my ETL servers and we're able to see the batch size and the batch processing time, you know, in real time as it's going, okay? Pretty awesome. And then you wanna think about your cluster topology. And this is a little bit more advanced. We don't really have time to get into it, um, but you know, you can allocate serving to a GPU node or to multiple nodes and it's distributed by default. So if the current machine doesn't have an instance of your serving, batch run is gonna go and look for it in the cluster. And you can actually design your cluster topology so that, you, uh, so that you're able to, to utilize uh, what we call it heterogeneous uh, topology. So you've got like some GPUs that are running your serving, you've got CPUs over here that might be cheap ones, and maybe you wanna use something like uh, Flame, but we'll, we'll leave that for another time. So, all right, very quickly, let's see it in action. So the custom classifiers that I showed you before. So you start with a project, as I said, projects centered around search. We've got a situation here, you know, you've got the left that gives you all the, the kind of inputs, you've got the right that gives you results. If you look at a single result tag, um, you've got, uh, you know, you can add a custom tag to it. Let's add this qubit generation tag. Um, we've got a list of tags and we've got the ability to go and generate uh, generate the, uh, the, the classifier for each of these. Um, so we go and we train a classifier, we can see some, some, some statistics on it, see how it's changed over time. We can go and predict it, as I showed you before. You can go and you can change, uh, you know, whether you've accepted it, rejected it, and then you can go and predict it on the new set, right? And because it's all happening like in the same memory space and all that good stuff, or in the same cluster, you can use PubSub to like, to broadcast your progress as it's happening, which is pretty sweet, it's free. Um, so 
What are the, the things that we need to build this? We need the vector representation of the documents. Well, you can use Bumblebee, right? You, I mean, you can use Axon if you are building something yourself, but if you've, you've got Bumblebee, you've got access to text embedding models out of the box. So that's three lines of code, done. You've got vector, rep vector representations. You need a way to train those models. So we use Scholar, right? Immediately, done. You need a way to store the models, right? So we can, uh, we've got, uh, um, We've got a serialization and deserialization within X. It allows you to store and, and bring back the weights. Um, and then we need a way to predict on new, new documents. And we're going to use serving for that, right? We use NX serving. So we've got all those pieces, simple as, and you can go straight to production, as long as you follow the checklist. Quick little, um, a quick little uh, spotlight here. Um, we're just going to have a quick look at the way that Explorer and Vega Lite work together. Um, so. Explorer allows you to construct data frames really quickly on the fly based on the data that you have. And Vega Lite allows you to uh, produce uh, visualizations using Elixir to write up a, a Vega Lite specification which will run in JavaScript. And so what you can actually do is uh, use that to very quickly iterate on data and very quickly generate new data um, and, it and allow you to use uh, your uh, live view interactions to very rapidly change your visualizations. This is actually taken from our live application. Okay. And I think, do I have enough time to cover anything? Yeah, okay. So the last thing is uh, map visualization. So I showed you this a little bit before. So you may wanna see your, your documents in two dimensions. And what we've done is plotted these onto a two dimensional uh, grid, basically. We've taken the 1024 or you know, whatever size vectors that we have and we've reduced them down into two dimensions and plotted those on. Then what we've done is we've taken, um, we've taken those two dimensional plot, you know, those two dimensional representations uh, and we've, given, we've clustered them and so we've assigned each of them a cluster ID and then we've taken those clusters and we've generated, uh, we've generated uh, labels for each of the clusters. That's actually using generative AI to do that. So, you know, you can then interact with it. You can see the different aspects of the metadata. You can move it around. You can do what I showed you before, where you represent the different clusters, where you can see that there are these pockets of dark green, pockets of dark red. You know where you want to look. It brings a ton of value. So what do, we want, what do we need to build this, right? We need the vector representation of the documents to begin with. Okay, Bumblebee, great, we've got that. We need a way to bring those representations down to two dimensions. Scholar's got your back. Scholar has dimensionality reduction. It has t -SNE, okay? We need a way to plot that on the page, okay? Vega light, boom, immediately. Um, we need a way to interact with complex metadata. Um, okay, then now we've got, uh, we've got Explorer. So we can go and we can chop and change, as I said before, uh, and rapidly generate those, uh, those Vega light specifications on the server instead of sending all the data to the client. You can chop and change it on the server and immediately and rapidly change those, uh, those um, those uh, specifications, uh, and then you need a way to identify the technology clusters and understand the, te the technology clusters. And generative AI has your back. You can use Bumblebee, you've got Llama, um, and you've got, you've got Mistral. You've got all those wonderful things. Um, and so there we go, that's it, thanks. Thank you, Chris, that was excellent. Um, qu right quick, we have one question. Okay. Um, what has been your experience converting ML experts uh, in the Python ecosystem, and do you have a short sales pitch for that? Oh, a short sales pitch. I, I, as, as you can tell, I'm not good at short. Um, I think the, the thing that I focus on when I'm trying to proselytize is the, the uh, integratedness, the in integration of the whole stack. So the way that NX gives you all that basis for everything else is really simple. And for me, as a data scientist, that was, that was the biggest selling point. And I, and I have actually converted a few people. So some of my friends back in Melbourne are actually using Elixir now for, for data science. And uh, got a, I know another team in the US uh, who's using Elixir for data science now based on, based on that. So good experience with it and focus on the integrated aspects. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Let's give Chris another big round of applause.